My name is Baruch. I'm working for JFrog as a developer advocate. I'm not a lawyer, if you're asking. Uh, but part of my job definition is writing code, and the other part is talking about it. This is what we're going to do now, talk about the code that me and you will write. Uh, my GitHub, my Twitter handle, if you are interesting. Uh, why JFrog is so much into Jenkins? Well, we are very good friends. Uh, we support Jenkins from day one of the fork and uh, Hudson uh, even before the fork. Uh, we have our own very powerful uh, plugin, the Jenkins Artifactory plugin, which is rather complicated and uh, that's why we know how to write Jenkins plugins. Um, Java user conference in Israel was very successful and we had the honor to host it. Um, uh, uh, repo jenkinsci.org is a um, binary repository of Jenkins hosted uh, by um, uh, JFrog as uh, our small contribution to Jenkins community and uh, to the open source in uh, general. And uh, starting tomorrow, we will going to have a wonderful uh, demo zone at our common booth uh, demo grounds in uh, Java 1. So you are all welcome to come and uh, see some cool stuff and cool demos. Okay, so what we are going to talk about today. We'll start with uh, some voting and uh, some guessing. And then uh, we are going to talk about uh, working with remote agents and um, uh, working in multiple operation systems, working in uh, multiple platforms, uh, and creating uh, UI using Groovy instead of Jelly, and uh, writing our own custom tags, uh, and maintaining backwards compatibility when our plugin is uh, refactored and uh, evolved. Uh, we will start with some uh, guessing. Um, in my agenda of the talk, I mentioned that this talk is actually a sequel for a Take a control, write plugin part one that uh, one of our guys, Noam, um, delivered during the Java user conference in Israel. And it was a link to YouTube, uh, which you are always uh, invited to see as a preparation for this talk. So, who actually saw it? Okay, not bad. One or two hands, exactly as I thought. Okay, um, that's okay. We are going to uh, do a little intermezzo and get back uh, to Israel when it's warm and the sea is warm and the weather is nice and the girls are beautiful. And we are going to review uh, what, was, uh, the what the talk was about in uh, 15 minutes. So, previously in Take Control, write a plugin. Uh, first, why write plugins for Jenkins? Um, it's, we can do a lot of things with plugins, everything is possible except one very important thing and this is making coffee. You cannot make Jenkins make coffee. Except of it, everything is, uh, is doable. Uh, what you can do, yeah, right, make coffee. Uh, statistics, uh, we showed uh, a lot of statistics about how plugins are successful in general, how our, our plugin is doing well also. Um, what you can extend, you can extend the UI of course by creating new views, by creating parts, new parts of existing views, uh, etc. We are going to see some code uh, and uh, I will show it to you. Uh, the CSM integration, uh, you can provide uh, new uh, support for new version control systems, etc. Uh, the build process is itself, we can interrupt uh, in it, we can extend it, uh, add things to it. Uh, we are going to show uh, another example. Um, the slave management, we can uh, do uh, st stuff remotely and this will be the part of today's talk and not the uh, overview of uh, the last talk. And the tooling, uh, we can support new tools like sonar or um, static code analysis tools, etc., etc. Um, and uh, many, many more. Uh, and uh, 
you can even create your own extension points and do uh, even more crazy stuff. This is too advanced even for today. It will be in take control, right plugin, part three. Um, environment for creation and plugins. Um, ID support, um, all major uh, IDs have a good support. Uh, we particularly love IntelliJ IDEA, so the code uh, you will see today will be in it, but um, Eclipse is good, uh, Netb NetBeans is good, uh, so whatever uh, you like. And you can build your plugin in Maven or in Gradle, uh, similar functionality for whatever you prefer. Uh, the example uh, we did uh, in this talk was the motivation plugin. Uh, the target is uh, to reward fail build with some insulting uh, mockery, and we will see it works nicely. Um, a number of very simple parts, the global configuration where you can uh, write exact the sentence that will be outputted to the, to the log. And uh, the project configuration, you can enable or disable this configuration per project. And the outcome, of course, is a message that uh, appended to the log after a failing uh, build. So uh, let's see it. Okay. okay, so here is it. Let's start with uh, the global configuration. You can see here, this is a Jelly UI, uh, and uh, those tags are added to the global config screen. They will add uh, the part for the motivation plugin. And in this part, we have some text box uh, in which you can input the message that will be later added to the build. This is the project configuration. Again, it adds a new part to existing project configuration. In this part, you can see a one simple checkbox, and this checkbox uh, will populate existing uh, field uh, if it's uh, stored inside the settings. It will be checked or non-checked, depending on the current status um, of the plugin. And uh, uh, this is the plugin itself. Uh, you can see it extends notifier. Uh, this uh, defines an extension point. Uh, this plugin is a notifier, which means it uh, notifies something in the plug in the plug in the build log. Data bound constructor. Data bound constructor. Uh, the attributes here motivate failures will be uh, bounded automatically from the project settings. As we saw, there is a checkbox. So that's the reason it's Boolean. The perform method, as you see, it came from the interface. And this is where uh, the actual work is done. Here it's very, very simple. We check that uh, the build is failed. And we uh, have this feature of motivate failing, uh, failings enabled. And then we print to, uh, to the logger our motivate our motivating message, okay? The one that was set in the settings. In the meanwhile, I'll start it up and we will see it live. Okay, so Here it, uh, it will build the project, and meanwhile, let's see other parts of the class. Another very important, pla uh, very important uh, part is the descriptor. The descriptor, actually, this is the plugin configuration. Um, it uh, gets uh, serialized to the disk uh, in form of XML settings file and uh, it deserialized to this class. So this is the descript uh, this is the getter for descriptor impl and here's the descriptor impl itself. You can see that it holds the state, the configuration of the plugin, uh, the default motivating message and this is the same field that we saw in the UI. They correspond to the field in Jelly UI 
And uh, here you can see the deserialization uh, code. Forum gets string, takes the string from the UI and from the XML and populates this Java, uh, this Java object. The serialization and deserialization works with this XML file. This is an extension to Jenkins configuration. You can see here again, it's the same uh, field because uh, this is what populates the state of the plugin. Okay, plugin failed, the build was failed, and here we see our motivating message. The build failed, now it's going body. Of course, you can change it in the configuration and it will be changed here. So, very simple plugin, very simple parts, and now you know how to write Jenkins plugin. We can get back to today's session. Okay. So, next part is working with the remote agents. Jenkins has remote agents. Uh, the way we, inter we interact with them is that we send parts of work to the remote uh, agents, and we do it in way of closures. We wrap some logic that should be executed on the remote side with closure and send it to the remote. Uh, the closure that should be sent from one machine to another is um, implementation of the interface callable. And it is sent by using simple Java serialization. With all the implications that you can think about, everything should be serializable, etc. Closure, as I said, we don't have closures in Java, not until Java uh, 8 at least. You missed the keynote of Brian Getz, but I can, th I can uh, tell you that he is going to talk about Java 8 has closures, so you have it here. You missed nothing. Good place to stay. Uh, what do we have for now without closures? We have this Im uh, interface callable that we need to implement. Usually we, z we implement it with anonymous inner class, which is uh, not a, m a mandatory obligation, so you can select if you want to do it otherwise. And here is a simple example. Uh, get system properties is a callable, and this code will be sent to each, and, uh, each one of the agent. So uh, each one of the agents will run this code on uh, its machine, and of course will collect different set of properties depending on the machine. And then the results, which is a, a, which is a properties object, will be serialized and set back to the master when the, where the plugin is running. So uh, in this way, we can collect the properties of the remote machines and get them in, a, in our uh, in our plugin on the master. Um, this is the way you actually send your closure to the remote agents. You use something uh, which is an object of channel. So what is channel? Channel represents the communication tunnel, the communication socket between the master machine when your plugin is running and the remote machine when you want to execute your closure. You can get a channel from various uh, objects, uh, from the file path, from launcher, from CLI, etc., etc. Usually, when you uh, write your plugin, in the context of your plugin, you will find a channel or one of the objects that you can get a channel from available when you write your plugin. So just look for some object that, that, that has a method that return channel, and this is the channel you want. It's not a big issue. We will see an example in a minute. Uh, let's talk a little bit about distribution abstractions. One of them is the file uh, is the file path. File path is the device that will help us to work with the remote files. We want to work with them as they were local, but actually we know that they are not on our machine. So file path uh, file path will help us to understand where the file is and how to work with it. Um, it's much like Java util file, the regular file that you work with in Java, but 
it has the semantics of being remote or local. We don't know, and uh, Jenkins will provide uh, this information for us. Uh, we can get the file to the master by using the file path itself if uh, we need it on the master. The other way is pushing the logic to, uh, to the remote file. So, uh, for example, if you want to query properties of a file, if you want to understand if it's readable or not, you can bring the file to the master machine where your plugin is executed and work as it as being local file but, and then send it back if you change something. But this is probably not very efficient. The most, more efficient way will be sending a closure to the remote machine and ask about the properties of the file over there, right? So file pass has its own way to push the logic towards the file, and this is the act method which uh, receives a file callable. File callable is a variation of the same callable we saw earlier, but it has all the file uh, information attached to it, so it's uh, much more uh, comfortable to use. Another abstraction is launcher, and here is a launcher, and here is a remote, because it's not a launcher, it's a remote launcher. Remote launcher allows us to launch stuff remotely. It's much like a process builder in Java that allows you to uh, invoke uh, external processes, and of course it's a very important part of any build server, because build server should run builds which are external processes, Maven, Gradle, Script, etc. So it's very important, and we need the ability to be able to launch those processes on the remote machine. So that's the reason why the launcher plays a central uh, role in uh, Jenkins, and you should be able to work with it when you write your plugin. Uh, of course, uh, when you uh, invoke some script, you pass environment variable to it, right? Uh, being it path or Java home or Maven home or whatever path variables you need. And uh, this part is a little bit tricky because the variables that you have in hand are the variables of the master. When we're, you are going to invoke a process which is a remote. So path or Java home on the master won't necessarily be the same on your slave. So you need to pick the variables very carefully when you select what you should pass and what you should understand and analyze on the uh, remote slave uh, itself. Next. Next, uh, we are going to, uh, to talk uh, about something relatively similar, and this is working with multiple operation systems. So you know Java. Java is write once, run anywhere. But, and the but is about working with launchers and working with files and working with external system. Because the external system, the operating system, the platform is different. So the Java code will work. The launcher, where you need to pass some file path, not so much. So we have the issues with the slash and the backslash uh, Windows and uh, uh, Linux. You have the issue of invoking scripts, bash scripts, and batch scripts. Uh, you have the issue of wrapping your command with the quotes when you have to do it in Windows, when you have to do it in Linux, when you don't have, etc. Uh, and you have an issue of permissions, POSIX permissions, and Windows permissions, and all those, this stuff is different. So, files, process launchers, and multi-platform are tricky. All of three of them together. We're going to talk about permissions uh, in a while. Now let's see something that looks like very s simple. You need to run a script. You need to, uh, to execute file remotely. File, file path, execute. Launcher remotely different operation system or not. How you do it? This is the code that should work. And let's see if you can spot the error. Maybe Koski will be able to spot the error. I will give you a second.
No, the system dot out is the Java abstraction and should work whatever for whatever uh, output stream is. Lowercase, uppercase, let's assume that the batch file names are okay. Yeah, new file, thank you very much. I, ha I wish I had a t-shirt to throw on you, but yes, this is exactly the problem. And the problem is that this object is constructed locally. The file object, the file abstraction is constructed on the master. So it takes the path it takes the file separator, which is correct for this operation system, the master operation system, and it concates the script name to it. So we will get the separator, which is correct for the master, but we are trying to launch it on the remote machine. We have the launcher here that should launch it on the, uh, on the remote. So if the remote is the same operating system, we are good. But if the remote is a different operating system, then we have a problem. So what should be done? We should, uh, once we already know to determine between Windows and Unix operating systems, we need to work with the file separators here when we decide which one of them, and then construct this queries the remote, the easy Unix, and then construct our command line as a single string with all the knowledge embedded inside about the correct uh, slash or backslash style. And this will work. Jenkins has uh, some utilities inside to help us build the correct string. I'm just showing it to you done manually so it will be more clear. But uh, here on the launcher, you will see a lot of CMD method overloading, which gives you different uh, styles of uh, working with the remote, which should include correct guessing of if the line should be uh, um, uh, in quotes or not in quotes, should contain one or other style of uh, slashes, etc., etc. So basically, this type of things you should be aware of, and uh, it's, it's not that trivial and you need to pay attention. Basically, it's very simple. Your plugin won't work on the slave, so you know you're in trouble. <laughs> okay, this is a little bit of intermezzo. This is not something directly um, um, related to Jenkins or uh, the usage of files in, uh, in Jenkins, but I just love to see the binary plate in this slide. It's kind of nice and messy. This is how you determine uh, which permissions you have on the file on different operation systems. This is a stuff from a new I.O. A package of Java 7, which allows us to work not only with Windows permissions, but only with POSIX permissions. So this is what you need to do. You can see here, this is a file path get channel call. We'll launch some piece of code on the remote machine. So all this code will be executable on the remote, and then we want to know what are the permissions on the, our remote machine. We get the file systems, and probably it will be one, so we ask if it's DOS, which means Windows. If it's DOS, then we need to use DOS file attribute class, because DOS file attribute class view will contain the DOS permissions. And here we can ask if it's read only. If we contain, if the system contains POSIX, which is Linux-based operation system, then we need to use some other class, which is POSIX attributes view. And this class contains all the stuff that you love, the numbers, the 777, and uh, all, all, all the Unix permissions. And here, it's uh, actually wrapped in nice API, uh, where you can query stuff like, the permissions should not contain POSIX file permissions are the right. I'd assume it's like read-only. This kind of code, although being boilerplate and blowed, um, it's actually the right way to work with different operating systems when it comes to files. Excuse me. Why 
Yeah, of course. This is just maybe a silly example, but it's just an example of how you work with permissions. Maybe asking for read only is not the, the right thing to do, but uh, you know, it's just to show you how the new IO deals with the permission stuff. Uh, probably trying to create a file and failing, then being censored only, it's the way we're ready to do right. Thank you. Yes, of course, of course. This is very naive code. It's just, if I would uh, write, uh, write it correctly, it would take like more three more slides like that, right? So let's try to keep it simple. But of course, this is very naive. Like most of the examples I show, it's more important to be, to be concise and understandable than doing the actual right things of term of protecting all the possible possibilities in my code. But thank you for that. Okay, so that was a lot of code that deals with files, launchers, and different operation systems. Now get back to the UI. It will be nice and easy. Let's see how can we create a UI in Groovy. You know, the UI of Jenkins is created with Jelly, which is a templating engine based on XML, which feels a little bit like JSP. You saw it in our uh, review of the plugin, and probably you know it from your own plugins. And now let's see how we create it in Groovy. So first, let's look at the docs. This is the documentation for all the documentation that is out there for writing a UI in Groovy. When I look at this, I see this. We have a mailing list in which there are a number of mails dealing with Groovy plugins. And uh, one of the mails are from Koske, uh, where he's recommend the following. When you have a lot of programming logic, don't do it in XML, obviously. Do it in Groovy. On the other side, when there are lots of HTML markup, do it in Jelly. They are very similar in terms of what you can do. You can reuse all the existing Jelly tags and Jelly tag libraries from Groovy. It just looks like Groovy and not like XML. So you can actually do the right thing and select the right thing. I'm very uh, big supporter of Groovy and uh, I dislike a little bit the XML. Basically it's a legacy from EGB2, who forever remember. So my suggestion is the following. But really you should, you should pick up whatever uh, it's best for you. Uh, I think that when we are going to get to our next chapter, you will be convinced that this is the right thing to do. But let's wait. So this is how it looks. This is the comparison. You can see here the jelly. It's pure XML with attributes. You can see we use the namespaces here. We use the core namespace. We use the forum namespace. And this is the code Groovy here. We don't even need to import the core because it's not XML, so we are not mandated to uh, declare all our namespaces, and the core is already there. So we also, uh, we only add the namespace, uh, the F, the for namespace, and then this is exactly the XML. You can see f.section is exactly the same of f section here. Uh, the attributes of XML here are uh, maps here, map pairs here, and uh, the text box is text box. So, this is not very impressive in terms of being more concise. It's about the same size, especially the line numbers are almost the same. But this is code. And this code is fully debuggable. You can trace it. You can stop with the debugger. You can step into it. You can see what's happening. You can understand what's going wrong. And uh, if if there are people that try to run uh, to to write jelly UIs, they know how important this ability of stepping step by step in, uh, in debugger is, because jelly is very very hard to debug. It's very hard to understand what went wrong. It's really hard to pinpoint the problem. In with Groovy UI, it's very very simple. Yeah, real code debuggable, etc. Yeah, so uh, we're going to see next how to write custom jelly. Yeah, sure, go ahead. It's all the same. 
it's all the same. You still uh, use Maven, you still use Gradle. If it's Gradle, you need to add the Groovy plugin. If it's, Ma if it's Maven, you also need to add the plugin which compiles Groovy, but all the rest is exactly the same. Let's see how to write custom jelly tags. First, let's look at documentation. The documentation for writing jelly tags looks like this. Since there is no documentation for writing jelly tags, we won't write jelly tags. Instead, we will write groovy tags, which is, of course, easier, nicer, debuggable, etc. So it's easy as one, two, uh, that's it. There is no even three. First, we need to implement our tag library. Our tag library is a groovy class. It's a very simple Groovy class. It should extend some uh, infrastructure class, which will uh, bring us support for a namespace. Here, we can have this builder object that we can uh, import namespaces from it. So here, we will import a tools namespace out of our builder. And here are our tags. Our tag library contains of only one class, uh, only one tag. We can add how many tags as we want. And here, it's an evil laugh. What it does, it prints a label. This is all we need to do to implement a tag library in Groovy. This is all. Next thing, we are going to use it. So here, this is our the same uh, config that we saw earlier with the entry and the checkbox. And we are going to add this label to it. This is how we do it. We create a new tag lib and provide the builder, the same builder that we are using here, right? This is the builder. Where this builder comes from? It comes from the support that Jenkins provides in the, Jelly, uh, in the Groovy UI. So we just have it in our script. We provide it to our uh, tag library, and now we are good. Once we did it, we have our new namespace, which is actually isn't a namespace even. It's a Groovy object. And all we need to do now is call methods on this Groovy object. And this is exactly what we do. We just call a method. So if we had some content inside our XML or some attributes on our XML, it would come here. The attributes would be a, a map of attributes, and the content will be a closure that we would attach here after this method. So it's actually code what can be better, right? This is almost it. We have only one topic more to talk about. Uh, and this is the maintaining backwards compatibility. Uh, back to our motivation plugin, I will show you the code for one more time. Here. So we're actually in the right place. I'm going to do a little bit of uh, refactoring. You remember the default motivation message? I don't like the name, because it's actually not a default message once I changed it. But, so I would like to refactor it to being just motivating message. So there are tons of places that I need to change. Here, here in our class, of course, we have the field, we have the setter. In the global jelly, I have uh, the field again. And, and here is the persistence that Jenkins saves on our file system when we shut it down for the next time. Now, I can change it here. The problem is that I have, hopefully, I have users of my plugin, which are, of course, outside. And they won't change this XML file for me. So next time I deliver a new version of plugin for them, my plugin will try to deserialize this uh, XML file and won't, fi and won't find the, fi the, the field because there is no more field default motivating message, right? So this is basically the problem. Let's see how we do it. Okay. So uh, yeah, refactoring, we rename the field, and we have a problem 
with the existing serialized configuration on our, uh, uh, with our clients. What we should do is use the extreme uh, aliasing capabilities in order to be backwards compatible. This is how we do it. All we need to do is to register an initializer for Jenkins that will run before the plugins are started because when plugin is started, this object gets serialized and then we won't find our field. So before that, we need to run some code and any method, any static method without uh, attributes can be declared as initializer and run before specific stage during Jen Jenkins startup and we use it uh, before plugin started. And here we use extreme, which is exposed through items uh, object, is, uh, items class, and we alias a field. This is the alias we want to put on a field in this class. The name of the field is that. Very simple. Next time, old XML will be deserialized. Extreme won't find the default motivating message field, but it will go through a list of, through a map of aliases and will find the correct field to uh, deserialize the contents of this field too. Next time it will be saved, it will be saved correctly and uh, it will work afterwards without uh, getting to the aliasing. It could be done for fields, it could be done for classes. So if you rename the class, the same technique, instead of using alias field, we will use alias class and it will be the same. Sometimes you have more complicated refactoring where your aliasing won't work. You change stuff, uh, you move classes around, etc., etc. Then you can use another feature of stream which is uh, converters. And uh, this is the class that extreme will delegate serialization and deserialization to. In this class, of course, you can do whatever you like, right? So. Uh, um, this is how we do it. It's actually very simple and uh, your, your clients will be thankful for you for doing that. Thank you very much. Come to our uh, demos on tomorrow. Uh, you can find all of us there asking questions about this stuff, any other stuff, and uh, thank you for coming.